All right, so let's talk about vision. What do you say? Who remembers that time I told you about the three-step process in the nervous system, right? Kata, I said that was input, calculation, and output. I said you can apply this to any level, right? Whether that's an ion channel, a neuron, a group of neurons, an entire system, or an organism, right? And so for thinking about vision, that's clearly going to be a, sort of an input system, right? Because we're going to be collecting information from the outside world. We're also going to do some calculations. And of course, parts of the visual system are going to send outputs to the rest of your nervous system so that you can make actions, right? And so you can do the things you need to do. So again, we can still use that three step process, apply that to the visual system, and we'll have some fun. So we will talk about, uh, I think we can get through all of this. We'll talk a little bit about the eye. It's important to understand that receptive apparatus, right? If we're going to be, Jaron, if we're going to be pulling that information in, we need to sort of understand how that works, right? We'll talk about some brain regions involved in visual processing, color, shape, spatial, it should be vision. Yeah, you don't have to know about spatial cations. Um, and orientation and movement is going to be exciting. And at some point, we're going to watch a video. Who loves cat videos? All right, it's a cat video. Who knew? Jacob, I tell people it's a video that changed my life. No, in all seriousness, it is. Uh, so, how many of you have heard of sensation and perception? Right? That's a class you can possibly take. Uh, you might not want to after this semester. I'm the only person who teaches it on campus. So that's just a warning to you. If you sign up for it next semester, you're going to have to listen to me again. We are offering that next semester, Jake, in case you, you can't take it. In case you're curious. Sensation. So what do we mean by sensation? When we talk about this, this is when the cells in your nervous system detect a physical or some sort of stimulus from the environment, right? So if we're talking about vision, the stimulus we're thinking about is light. The cells in your nervous system are going to be located in the retina, and we're going to talk about rods and cones, right? Some of you have probably had some sort of introduction to rods and cones in the past, right? Is that true? You guys know they exist? Okay. When we think about perception, we're going beyond that, that detection, that initial level of processing. And we're thinking about what is that interpretation, what is that conscious experience, right? We're pulling that information from the senses, and how does that work? So if we look at something and we recognize that it's red, we recognize that it's round, okay, so maybe, you know, our retina is getting activated by these things, whatever, that's fine. When we realize that's an apple, when we think about how hungry we are and how tasty that apple would be, that's clearly how we're perceiving things and, and, and how we're interpreting that stimulus. Sometimes the line between sensation and perception is not clear where you're going to put that, right? I'm not going to ask you too much about it, but just be aware of what's going on. When we think about color, we want to describe this, right, in some way that we can measure. We might think about hue. When we think about hue, that's what most of us sort of would call the color, right? Is it red? Is it blue? Is it green? But when we think about hue, we're thinking about the dominant wavelength, right? So what is that wavelength of light? Is it that wavelength? Is it this wavelength? Okay. Different wavelengths of light are perceived as different colors. They are not actually different colors. They're perceived that way, right? They're just different wavelengths of light. If something is 700 nanometers, we might perceive it as red. If it's 400 nanometers, we might perceive it as blue. Doesn't mean that it's actually blue, right? It's just how you perceive it as blue. It's quite possible you could perceive it as something else. It doesn't really matter, right? When we're thinking about intensity, we're going to think about amplitude. Same wavelength, right? Peak to peak, trough to trough, it's the same distance from, from you know, top to top. But if we're going from peak to trough, that's a much deeper, it's a higher amplitude, right? The other thing we think about is purity. So if we're thinking about a dominant wavelength, what are the other wavelengths that are included there, right? So if we think about red, we think about red's dominant wavelength here. 
What's another color similar to red? It's like pink. We could really think of pink as what we call a desaturated red. Yes, the dominant wavelength is still going to be, let's say, 700 nanometers, but other wavelengths are going to be in there, right? And they're going to kind of dilute that, right? So you'll have other wavelengths of light in that'll desaturate that and make that a pink. Who remembers this guy? That's a neuron, right? Let's draw the myelin sheath in there for you. Okay, so uh, we have neurons. That was a generic neuron, right? We saw that and I said, hey, you'll never see something like this or it's just completely generic. When we think about sensory receptors, these guys are, I would like to put highly specialized. And then I would say, well, like all neurons are highly specialized. So we can like scratch that out. And then I think like, all neurons are specialized anyway, so maybe they're just neurons. But they're unique neurons, right? And they're going to be different. They're going to be designed through that process of evolution, right? They're going to be structured and built in a way that allows us to pick up a particular stimulus. So if we're thinking about light, we've got what we'll call photoreceptors. That's going to be awesome. Uh, how many of you have heard of sound? No pun intended. Uh, so, David, there's sound, right? And so for that, we're going to have, um, we actually have these things called inner hair cells. We'll talk about those maybe next week. So inner hair cells. Inner hair cells cannot perceive light. They perceive sound waves, right? Their structure does not allow them to pick up light. They pick up sound, okay? That's how it works. You don't hear things with your eyes. Right? You see things because your retina has those specialized photoreceptors that are going to detect, detect that particular category of a physical event. We're always connecting it back to that physical world, whatever that is, whether that's sound, whether it's light, whether it's a, a physical touch of some sort, right? That's going to cause pressure or maybe some pain. Uh, what about thermoreceptors, right? Like we have hot or cold. They're specifically for that particular type of stimulus. Not a big deal. Now, who remembers that guy, Johann Mueller? Right? And he had that doctrine of specific nerve energies. And he basically said everything's just an electrical impulse. Right? Okay. Guess what light is? Not an electrical impulse. Guess what sound waves are? Not electrical impulses. Right? So if we want our nervous system to be able to interpret this, we have to take whatever that sensory stimulus is, and we're going to transduce it, so we call it sensory transduction, into some kind of electrical signal, into a potential, right? And we call this a graded or a receptor potential, right? And so that's what we're doing. We're just taking that light, we're taking that sound, we're taking that mechanical pressure, whatever that is, and we're going to convert that into an electrical signal so that the rest of our nervous system can process that and can understand uh, that language, right? Because once you get deep into your brain, they don't understand light. They don't understand sound. They understand electrical impulses. So it has to be turned into an electrical impulse. Now, there are very complicated ways that this happens. We'll talk about it when we need to. And there's your receptor potential. Who loves the electromagnetic spectrum? Great. You all should. Uh, we'll talk about these things. We can detect a sliver of this, right? This is completely out of scale, okay? So if we were to actually make this, we should probably make this thing like the, from here to here, like the size of the Jones C. Edwards Stadium, right? And this should probably be the size of the white stripe on the 50-yard line, okay? That's about how much of the, like, electromagnetic spectrum or light is really what it is that you can actually detect right there are things here you can't detect now we have built things that will detect them how many of you have ever heard of the radio yeah that's that thing with the knobs right your car's got like some kind of long pole sticking up out of the middle of it right sometimes you see those while you're driving down the road okay radio waves or television waves you guys probably 
don't know if you guys think about broadcast television that much. You guys mostly get it through the cable, the cable pipe, right? Nobody knows. Anybody have an antenna? Nobody knows if they have an antenna. You have an antenna? You don't use it. Yeah, yeah. Most new TVs have a built-in digital tuner, right? So that's an antenna. It's an internal antenna. I mean, it's what they don't tell you. A few years ago, the FCC decided they were going to stop using analog signals, and they switched to digital signals, and that was a whole big mess. They were, like, giving people $40 certificates if you couldn't afford to buy a digital tuner. Do you remember that? That was a thing. So, radio waves, they're, like, this big. If you could, like, you could, like, put a person in there, right? Radio waves are huge. They're low energy, thankfully, right? Because there are radio waves blasting through us right now. How many of you guys have heard of the campus radio station? I mean, they're just trying to bowl you over with uh, radio waves constantly. Anybody work at the radio station? Great. Anybody listen to the campus radio station? All right, one person. Way to go. You're the person who gave them. They won an award recently. They must have just asked you about it. So they, they come with low energy. Uh, you guys should listen to that radio station more often, and some other time I could talk to you about why. It's not all good reasons. So, you've got line, uh, you've got that radio waves, not a big deal. Uh, hey, you've got radar. You guys have heard of radar, right? That's a thing. Uh, you guys have probably been watching a lot of radar images lately. Many of you have watched the news, right? There are a lot of radar images uh, with the weather. I'm going to skip over infrared rays because i got a cool story to tell you there. Hey, what about ultraviolet rays? How many of you love those? No one should. These are the ones that cause skin cancer, right? So most of the time you try to avoid those, right? So that's a good idea. Uh, what's really interesting, so let's have a conversation about birds and bees now. And I mean actual birds and bees, or that's not a euphemism, right? We're not to that chapter yet. So... What's cool about some birds and bees is they can actually see ultraviolet uh, light. So if you and I were to look at a flower, I'm going to draw my best flower here. That's not horrible. I don't know what kind of flower that is. Uh, let's say you're looking at that flower. It's like, whatever. Uh, if a bee were to look at that... It might have these cool striped patterns on it or something, right? But that you could only see that if you exposed it to ultraviolet light. And that's what might attract a bee or a bird. Those guys are pollinators. It might attract them to that flower if it's got a cool pattern. If they're sensitive to ultraviolet light, but you and I can't see it. So that's pretty awesome. X-rays, again, we're getting smaller. X-rays carry a lot of power. That's how we shoot them through you. This is why you shouldn't sign up for X-rays every day. Right, because over time, uh, you know that radiation will build up. Gamma rays, those are always awesome uh, for you, right? If you want to turn big and green and angry, you've got the gamma rays. Those are available for you. I skipped over infrared and and then uh, the visible light. So the visible light is sort of 400 to 700 nanometers. We call it visible light because we're sort of egocentric as a species, right? And Rosie, we decided well. If we can see it, then it's visible light. We don't care if anybody else can, uh, right? Or, or we don't care what the other species can see. Who cares? We're going to call it uh, visible light. So it's this 400 to 700, and that's in nanometers. For those of you that don't know how big a nanometer is, it's really, 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 really small. Okay? So just keep that in mind. So we're, like a millimeter, you know, that's small. This is even smaller than a millimeter, right? This is like down a few. Okay, so it's super small. Kind of high energy, right? This is why uh, light will uh, do things like make you hot, right? So you can feel the heat from that, right? Okay. It's carrying a lot of energy. Hey, who loves pit vipers? No one loves pit vipers? I got a cool story for you about pit vipers. Uh, so why do they call them pit vipers? Anybody know? Because if you have enemies, you can dig a pit and like throw them in with the snakes. And that's always... No. Um, they call them pit vipers because they actually have pits kind of back on their head just a little bit. And those pits are sen sensitive to infrared rays. We typically think of infrared as like a heat, right? So how many of you watch those uh, like television shows and they'll have like some infrared camera or something, right? 
And so that's what's going on. There's this guy in Germany who does research on sort of like odd sensory systems in animals, right? And one that he works on is pit vipers and those infrared things. So what he will do, he will uh, he'll just grab a pit viper. And you should always, you got to be careful because you should grab pit vipers by the head, not by the neck. And the reason I say that is because like all the rest of it's the neck, right, David? And so you don't want to grab it too far down the neck. But if you grab it by the head, you're safe. Uh, so he'll grab the pit vipers. And then, so Rosie, you think that's great. This guy takes electrical tape and wraps electrical tape around the eyes of this pit viper. So if it wasn't in a bad mood already, I mean, you put the electrical tape on the eyes, right? Then what he does is he, so now, this is the hardest part, I think, of the whole experiment. I mean, catching the pit viper was one thing, but now you've got an angry pit viper who has electrical tape over its face, right? Then he's got to put it back in its cage. So I imagine there's like some kind of like shot put throw to this, right, Rodney? Because you've you got to get that thing out of your hands. So he puts it in the cage. I think he lets it calm down a little bit. And then pit vipers, like most snakes, they eat rodents, right? So you can release a rat in there. Now this is a blindfolded pit viper. But the cool thing about it is they can still reach out and grab those uh, snakes or those uh, rats. They can eat the rats because they're sensitive to that infrared uh, sort of heat map. That's pretty amazing, right? I don't know what he does next to get the electrical tape off the pit viper. I imagine that would be a very difficult task. And if you just want to check, like, because you're wondering, like, are we sensitive to infrared? Uh, you could catch one of your friends sleeping and wrap their head in electrical tape and then see uh, when they wake up how well they get around. I highly recommend that. Questions about that? Comments, concerns? Anybody have a snake at home? They're going to go home and try this? No. Did I ever tell you about the time a student brought a snake to class? No. No. It was like an animal behavior class. It was the final exam day. And apparently something fell out of her ceiling and cracked her aquarium. And she didn't have anywhere else to put the snake. And so just brought it to class. Yeah. That was interesting. All right, let's think about the anatomy of the eye. Why do we want to think about the anatomy? If we think about the structure of your eye a little bit, we can understand how it works. That's awesome. Hey, on the, like, so, sort of the back inner surface of your eye, you've got these photoreceptive ce cells, uh, and that, all of that combined, that tissue we call the retina, right? And that's pretty cool. The cool thing about your retina is this is one part of your nervous system I can see without cutting open your body. This is one reason we know so much about the visual system. We know so much about how the eye and the retina works because we can see that. How many of you have been to the eye doctor? Then someone has seen your nervous system. That's like, I mean, that's a really like a little invasive. Uh, when they shine the light in your eyes, you know, that ophthalmoscope, right? And they take a look in there. They're trying to look at your retina to check your, uh, you know, the retinal health, see if there are any problems but they can see that neural tissue back there. And they can see it, again, without really cutting you open, which is pretty impressive. So we have these photoreceptors. They're basically going to take that photic energy, that light, and they're gonna convert that into those electrical potentials, right? So that electrical signal that we're, we're doing. So they're gonna collect photons of light. Now, for some of you who've been paying attention, you might have noticed I was talking about uh, light as a wavelength, and then I talked about it as like photons, right? That's because light is amazing and it can do whatever it wants, and we're not going to get too worked up about it, right? Sometimes we need to think about light as a photon, and sometimes we need to think about it as a wave. Just let it do its own thing and don't get too worried about it, and you'll be fine. So, we've got our photoreceptors. They're going to catch these photons of light as they're coming in. When they catch them, that's going to cause this awesome cascade of things we'll talk about briefly and it's gonna eventually create an electrical potential. You have two types of photoreceptors. You have rods, okay? Rods are sensitive to low intensity light. So you're gonna use rods sort of in darker environments, low light environments, right? So think about like nighttime. Cones on the other hand, they really need a lot of light, right? So they need high sort of light levels. There's also an interesting sort of structure here, so if you think about your 
retina, sort of the back of your eye like this. Uh, we're going to put all of your cones right there in the middle, right? And we're going to call that the fovea. And then out here, those are bad color choices, weren't they? Because now it looks like a bloodshot eye, and I didn't mean for it to. Out here, that's not getting any better. Uh, we're going to put all of your cones. And now this is your retina. This is the back of your eye, right? Not the front. It's the back. Okay. So we're going to put your cones out here. Now your cones are not going to be jammed in there as much as, or I mean your rods, I'm sorry. Your rods are not going to be as tightly packed as your cones. They're not sensitive to color. Okay, so the only color sensitive um, photoreceptors you have are the cones here in the middle. How many of you have ever thought you saw something at night? And then, yeah, Rodney, and then when you looked at it, what happened to it? It disappeared, right? The reason for that is, and you saw, you saw it kind of out of the corner of your eye, so to speak, right? So you see something, that's that periphery, right? That's out here, somewhere. You catch it with your rods, because your rods are really great in dark environments. But then when you go over, because your instinct is, I want to put it on my fovea, because I've got the most photoreceptors there, right? I'm going to jam everything right there, so I'm going to be able to see really well. And when you look at it, though, it disappears. Why? Because the guys here in the center, those cones, they need really high levels of light in order to be activated. At night, you don't have that. So when you look directly at it, it disappears. Then you look away and it reappears, right? And then you look away and it disappears. You can do that all day, well, all night long, not all day long. So there you go. Anybody ever think they saw a ghost that way? Happens all the time. That's all it is. 250% of ghost sightings are explainable by this. I promise. Hey, here's an eye. And your eye muscles. Anybody exercise your eye muscles? I always ask this. You guys should. Constantly. You know, you exercise other muscles, right? Exercise your eye muscles. The best way to do that is to move your eyes. Like constantly. And you can even attach weights to them if you want. Wouldn't recommend that. You can inject steroids in there if you just rub them in. See what happens. I'm gonna come in one day, some of you have like really swollen eye sockets. Um so you've got these powerful, uh, they actually are quite powerful muscles, right? And some of the fastest moving muscles in your body. Uh, you can just like move your eyes around, which is a lot of fun. Here's your eye. There are parts of your eye we need to think about. The cornea, that's kind of the outer part. So if you don't know where your eye's located, just do this. That's the quickest way to find your cornea, just right there. And as soon as you poke yourself in the eye, that's what you pick. There are things you shouldn't do to your cornea, like scratch them. Right? Don't try to like sand them down a little bit. That's a bad idea, right? How many of your eyes are hurting now? Uh, sometimes you have damage to your cornea. Sometimes there are things that happen to your cornea, right? Some age-related issues with your cornea. Anybody know what those might be? Macular degeneration is going to be a retinal issue. That's a good one, though. Age-related macular degeneration. We'll talk about that. My grandmother had the first cornea transplant in West Virginia. Well, that's interesting. How many of you have heard of cataracts? Yeah, that's a corneal issue, right? You can get that taken care of. When you get back past the cornea, you have a thing called the lens. Has anybody ever dissected an eye? No, no one has. That's what we should buy. Like a bucket of beef eyes, and you guys can just cut them open. Uh, some of you may have, you know, some folks have dissected things, right? Uh, the lens is the part of your eye. It's actually flexible, believe it or not. So if you've ever dissected it, it actually looks like a, like a hard butterscotch candy. Uh, but it's actually flexible. You will bend your lens, right? And it's kind of how you focus on things back and forth. You'll bend your lens so that the light waves coming in all get focused right on the back of your retina, right? There are some of you who are not able to do that. Some of you focus your light waves here, your, and some of you focus the light waves there. Some of you are nearsighted, and some of you are farsighted, right? Okay. What that is equivalent to is if you think about this projector and you think about this screen. If I move the screen 
too close to the projector or too far away, it gets fuzzy, right? This is the exact right focal length, okay? And some people's eyes are not the right size for their lens, right? And so their, their eye is a little larger, a little smaller, and that's why the focal length is off a little bit. There's an easy way to fix this. The easy way to fix this is to put another lens in front of your lens, right? We call those glasses, or if you put the lens right on top there, then that's contacts, right? So you can do that if you want. Then you can bend this where it belongs. Now, for some of you, you're thinking like, I don't have that problem now. Give it about three decades, and you're going to have a problem, right? So about the time you hit 50, these muscles are not going to be bending that lens. The lens gets a little harder. It doesn't bend as well. Uh, you may notice, I'm assuming some of you have parents that are approaching 50, right? That's like a reasonable estimate for, for how old you are. Uh, sometimes I remember when my mother-in-law's arms, for some reason, were too short for her to read the menu at dinner. Right? Do you see any of your parents like doing this when they try to read? They'll hold things farther out so that they can hopefully get it in focus. Uh, when that happens, please recommend that they get glasses. We do not want them driving, right, if they can't see things well. Right, Jacob? So keep an eye on that. I don't know if you know anybody that's going through that right now. But just watch out for it. Because they will hold way out there. You'll see people, you go out to dinner somewhere, you'll see, uh, you know, people of a certain age trying to do that. You know, other people hold the menu, like, at a reasonable distance. And that's when you know you're getting old. So watch out for that. When your arms, see, as you get older, your arms get shorter, apparently. It's nothing to do with your eyes. All right, questions about that? What else do I need to tell you here? Retina, we'll talk a little bit about retinal circuitry in a minute. I think that's it, right? Sounds good. Hey, look at that word, fovea. We already talked about that. We said that was in the retina. It's the most acute vision because we've jammed in all of those cones. So we have a high cone density. Now, these photoreceptors are going to send a signal to something called a bipolar cell. We'll talk about that in a minute. These bipolar cells are going to send a signal to a ganglion cell. We'll talk about that in a minute. These ganglion cells are going to have an axon that comes out. Now, we know about axons, right? Now, these axons are all going to bind together. They're all going to group up, and they're going to punch through the retina at a place called the optic disc. When they punch through the retina, then they're going to go on, make the optic nerve, go to your brain, do all kinds of fun stuff. The problem is when all of these fibers, and those are axons, when they go to exit through the retina, guess what we're not going to have there? If we only have axons, we don't have photoreceptors. Okay? So we're not going to have any photoreceptors at that part of the retina. Okay? If we don't have photoreceptors, guess what you can't do there? You can't see anything. Right? If you don't have any photoreceptors at all, you're not going to see anything. Okay? So you're not going to be able to see there. That's responsible for something called the blind spot. This is not the blind spot in your car. That's a different thing. That's because you don't have eyes in the back of your head. You're not a horse or a mule. Anybody have a horse or a mule? I asked about horses, but not about mules. So maybe, maybe something different. Do you know why they say mules are so sure-footed? Have you heard that, that mules are sure-footed? Yeah, so I'm going to tell you why. Uh, it's related to, the, to their feet and their eyes. You wouldn't know, necessarily think about that. Um, a horse, and this is one reason you should always ride a mule and not a horse. A horse uh, can only see its front legs when it walks, but a mule can actually see its back legs as well when it walks. That's pretty impressive, and it's the way their heads are shaped and their eyes are in there, so they can kind of, kind of like walk, you know, and they can see their back legs. So they got that extra kind of business there. So if you think about people, we can really only see. I'd love to tell you it's 180 degrees, right? But it's not. It's a little less than that, but that's fine. Uh, a horse, on the other hand, like they have their eyes on the side, they can see like maybe 300 degrees, right? Because they have their eyes out there. So that's something. I think about a flounder, though. I wonder how many. See, both eyes on the same side. Anybody like flounder? Yeah, it's actually it's actually a nice fish, right? Uh. Other cells that are in the retina besides your photoreceptors 
We talked about the bipolar cells. They're great about kind of collecting information across photoreceptors uh, and getting that information out to the ganglion cells. The ganglion cells are actually the first guys to fire an action potential. Okay? No one else in the retina is firing an action potential. Up until then, we just have these graded receptor potentials. We're not having a full action potential. Horizontal cells kind of grab between the bipolar cells and collect information. Amacrine cells do the same things between the ganglion cells. Here's a nice little diagram about the layers of the retina. These diagrams sort of irritate me because they are incorrect and there's an easy way they could have made them correct. Who remembers that time I told you the fovea is where all of the cones are and the periphery is where all of the rods are, right? Right, Sydney? There's no way you're going to have rods and cones intermingled like this, right? The only place where they will touch each other is at that sort of area between the fovea and the periphery, right? It's a small sort of thing to think about. So, light comes in. Interestingly, light has to travel through all of these the ganglion cells, the bipolar cells, and the photoreceptors before it hits something called the outer segment of the photoreceptors. This is the guy that's going to grab those photons, right? It's going to grab those photons with these photopigments. The photopigments change shape. And that causes some cascade of events that's going to send a signal back through these cells. Why is your retina in here backwards, right? Because you would think, well, I would want that flipped, right? We just want to flip that and put the photoreceptors at the front. The problem is photoreceptors are very delicate, okay? They're very delicate. And because they're delicate, they need extra support. And part of that extra support is this guy. And that's called the retinal pigment epithelium. This guy supplies nutrients to that outer segment, keeps it working, doing the things that it should do so that you don't, uh, you don't have a failure in your, your rods and cones, okay? This is a blind spot test. It's not going to work. It's not going to work because it's not the right size and it's not the right distance for you, okay? If this was closer, you could stare at this uh, plus sign. You could close your left eye. You can get these printed on cards or, you know, in a book or something. You can move it back and forth. Once you get it sort of, you know, this far from your face or so, give or take a little, that green dot will actually start to look like it kind of flickers and it'll disappear. Because that's where, sort of out in here in space, if I'm looking straight ahead, sort of like right out here is where the blind spot is, where we have zero photoreceptors, but all of those axons from those ganglion cells punching out, coming right through here to create that optic nerve. All right, here's another detail of that retinal circuitry. Keep in mind rods and cones, and this is a rod because it looks like a rod, and this is a cone because it looks like a cone, uh, are not going to be found intermingled like that, okay? They're going to be separated. Light comes in, gets caught in that outer segment. This is graded receptor potential, right? We're not doing action potential. And then right there, we're doing an action potential in the ganglion cell. We're going to send that through the optic nerve. Your horizontal cells, again, are collecting information across photoreceptors. Your amacrine cells are going to collect information across horizontal or, uh, bipolar cells. It's really nice to know what your neighbors are doing, right? Okay, it's a really good idea. If this photoreceptor gets excited, but this guy's not getting excited. Well, maybe something's going on, maybe something's not going on, right? It's really important to think about that. All right, transduction. We already talked about transduction a little bit. We said the photopigments are out there in the outer segment. Don't worry too much about opsin and retinol and those sort of things. Those are just parts of the photopigment that you're not going to really need to know. What happens when light hits the photopigment is it changes shape, and that starts a bunch of events. Okay. How many of you remember action potentials? Those were exciting, right? When we think about action potentials, 
we think that if a cell is activated, it's going to fire an action potential, right? It's going to become depolarized and fire an action potential. That works everywhere except in the retina. And the only place in the retina it doesn't work is the photoreceptors. So when light comes in and it's going to activate this photoreceptor, instead of becoming depolarized, it actually becomes hyperpolarized and it cuts off the release of neurotransmitter. Normally if a cell is activated, if it's excited, it's going to release neurotransmitter, right? That's the normal story. That is not going to be the story with photoreceptors. And that creates something really awesome called the dark current. Which as soon as I retire, Jacob, I'm going to start a heavy metal band called the dark current. And I think that's going to be great. Uh, so in 40 years, you know, mark your calendars. We'll have our uh, inaugural wor world tour. Be great. Nobody's going to come to that. So, who knows if, like, you ever think about it, like, is heavy metal going to be a thing in 40 years? Like, it's sort of a thing now, but it might not be then, right? Like, like polka is sort of a thing, but it used to be a bigger thing before. Did you see that movie with Jack Black about the polka guy? That was a weird movie. I mean, Jack Black's a weird guy. It's called The Polka King or something. It's this guy who, like, played, he had a polka band, and then he started ripping people off for investments or something. Went to jail for a long time, and then when he got out, he wrote, like, a polka rap song about his time in jail. Like, this is a true story. I mean, I couldn't make this up if I tried, because this is, it was on Netflix, I think. I don't know. Anyway, Jack Black was in it. If you have Netflix, type in polka and see what comes up. It's a fairly safe search term. Light comes in, hits that photoreceptor. We are going to hyperpolarize, right? We're going to become more negative. We're going to clamp off the release of neurotransmitter. Now, your bipolar cell, he knows this is happening, right? And so when that neurotransmitter release stops, your bipolar cell will actually depolarize, send a signal over to the ganglion cell and will fire action potentials. Okay, So the ganglion cell, the bipolar cell, they know what's happening, Sammy. They're not going to be confused by the photoreceptor who's in there backwards and doing backwards things. Okay, So they're ready for that. Not a big deal. Now why is this the case? There is the possibility that you could fatigue the release of these neurotransmitters, right? I mean, if you're constantly releasing neurotransmitter, Adriana, you might at some point run out. Now, would you rather run out while you're asleep or while you're crossing the street? Asleep. It's much safer, right? It's a much safer thing to do. If you run out of neurotransmitter, you're just like walking around on campus. That guy on the golf cart's going to hit you. I promise. Uh, I love how... Anybody ever live in those first-year freshman dorms? You guys know where they're located, right? Like on the other end of campus by the stadium and the rec center. So I walk by there sometimes. And I remember when they put in the sign that said, slow, watch for pedestrian. And I thought, there are two things wrong with that. One, I hope they're not just watching for one pedestrian, because I think there are more than one person walking, so it should be pedestrians. But that's a, you know, that's a grammatical issue. Secondly, who's driving through there? Right? It's just people who work here with the golf carts. They should just be careful anyway, right? I mean, because it's not like people from the community are like, I'm just going to drive through them. I mean... And if, if someone from the community does drive through the middle of campus, they're not reading the road signs. I, it really irritated me. Because that was like that was like one, like one guy or two guys, that's like half a day's work they spent on that. Right? That, that was just a total waste. And I don't know, they're fancy signs. They look expensive. I think it was a waste of money. Just let them hit the students. The students or the drivers? I, I think it's on the driver's fault at that point. If you're on a sidewalk and someone hits you in a, in a motorized vehicle, it's not the walker's fault. Because the sidewalk's for you to walk on. That's why it's called a sidewalk, not a side drive. That's called the road. It's a small irritation. but And it was like two years ago they put those signs in. It still makes me mad. 
what's the opposite story of this? Your eyes are closed. Light's not coming in. This guy's depolarized. It's releasing neurotransmitter. Let's draw check marks. And yes, Sean, these are left-handed check marks. Um, just in case you wanted to know. You know, most people make their check marks that way. That's a weird thing to do. Do you make left-handed check marks? I saw you're left-handed. That's why I asked. You've never done a left-handed check mark? You're doing it wrong. It feels weird. Yeah, I don't know. You should practice. How many of you are making check marks now just to see how you make them? Just like two people. So we're, we are releasing neurotransmitter. That's fine. The bipolar cell knows when that guy releases neurotransmitter, I should be hyperpolarized. And guess what? We're not firing action potentials. Okay? Because you got your eyes closed. Just like this. All right. This is a bit of a complicated concept. And so I really want to want to slow down just a little bit here to make sure you understand the concept of a receptive field. Okay. How many of you have ever looked out into the world? Okay. If we think about that, we can think about the world sort of uh, as a hemisphere, right? As like a circle. So if we kind of create this circle around our heads. And what you might realize is that when you look out into the world, you can take this sort of grid and, and it just moves with you everywhere you go, right? So you constantly can see, and we're going to assume, you know, it's like 180, right? We'll just assume that. Uh, that may or may not be true, but we'll assume it's 180 degrees. It's just half of a globe, right? That's what you can see in front of you. Every cell that is in your retina is going to be responsible for a small piece of your visual world. Okay? It could be this piece, or this piece, or here, or here, or anywhere else out in space. You're going to have a cell, probably a number of cells, right, that are responsible for that sort of small circular circular area of the world. And that's going to move. Every time you move your head, wherever that is, it's going to move. It's going to be in relation to your visual world, not the actual world, right? And so it's going to move with you as your head and eyes. That's great. So every cell is responsible for a piece of the world. If that cell dies, guess what happens? You can't see what's there. And that's true because this of retinal cells, and as we move back through the thalamus and the cortex, each of those cells will also have a receptive field. Now, Rosie, over time, these receptive fields are going to get a little larger because we're going to pull information from multiple photoreceptors, right? You can combine that to make a larger receptive field. They're not going to be big. They're still going to be really small. Because if your receptive fields are too big, imagine you only had four receptive fields. And I'm looking out into the audience here, and I have four receptive fields. Do you know what I can see? I can see gray, and I can see white. And that's all I'm going to see. Because I'm not going to be able, you know, I'm going to be averaging out everything else in between, right? Because I'm going to average out whatever's in there. It's sort of like, uh, like, I think about it like video games. You guys play video games? You've seen video games? You know video games exist? Okay, you can look them up on the internet. Uh, some of you may have, uh, you know, how many of you own like a, uh, like one of those classic Nintendo re-releases, right? Anybody have one of those? Nobody has one? Somebody wants one? All right. So, Sean, you know the graphics on that. It's like 8-bit graphics, right? And so everything's going to be squares. And they're kind of large squares, right? And so if you were going to play a game, you know, and you've got a fist, it's just a big square, right? I mean, that's all you have. This is what's moving, okay? Because the graphics are not that great. Now, as you move into, like, a more advanced game, uh, you know, that's taking advantage of maybe like, you know, uh, HD or 4K graphics, you start to get these smooth boundaries and, and whatever, right? Because the receptive fields, the pixels, are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and you get a much more detailed and a finer image, right? 
So that's what we're thinking about with receptive fields. If all your receptive fields were this big, then your view of the world is going to appear to be sort of pixelated, right? As your receptive fields get smaller, look how much more detail I can pull from there because all of those receptive fields are smaller. It's pretty awesome, right? There are different types of eye movements. We should talk about those. There's vergence. Uh, so if you take your finger and you kind of follow it back and forth, your eyes are going to turn in and out, right? That's vergence. Uh, saccadic eye movements are kind of cool. These things happen all the time. How many of you have ever looked one place and then another really quickly? It, trust me, it happens all the time, right? And your eyes are constantly moving. So let's say we show you a picture of something and you're just, just moving your eyes around like that, right? You even make what are called micro saccades. That's like your eyes just kind of kind of vibrate a little. This is one reason why that blind spot doesn't bother you, right? It doesn't bother you because you're constantly moving it into different places, right, Sydney? So each time you move it, it's only there a few hundred milliseconds. Who really cares? Uh, and your brain will just kind of collect information from around it, does a little Photoshop sort of, you know, uh, clone and blur sort of thing, and it fills it in. It's not a big deal. The other type of eye movements are what we call smooth pursuit. This is if you see something and you want to track it as it moves. The amazing thing about this is you cannot imagine that you're going to do this. This is something, Sean, that I try to do every day just to check. Right? You should check this every day just to make sure reality is what it is. Um, if you wake up one day and you can imagine, trust me, Rosie, you, you, you have these existential sort of moments in your life and you should do this. Like, wake up one day and you're like, I'm not certain if this is really... Because if I ever have like this like alternate reality I can create in my mind, I'm going to be able to fake smooth pursuit, right? That's going to be my Leonardo DiCaprio spinning top. So I know if I'm really in somebody's head or whatever. Did you guys see that movie Inception? No one saw that? You saw it. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. So for me, it's I don't have a top because I'm going to lose that. Uh, but it's, it's faking out smooth pursuit. So let's imagine you want to watch like, like there's something like moving across, right? Uh, you can't do it. Every time you try, your eyes will just jump. They'll make a saccade. You cannot make a smooth movement with your eyes. And you can if you're watching something, right? If you're watching someone walk, uh, you, can, you can smooth pursuit, but you cannot imagine that they're walking because you'll just keep doing the little saccades across the path where you imagine them. You guys want to take a moment and try that? Because you don't believe me. It doesn't work. I mean, it'll give you a headache if you keep trying. So they tell me. I don't know from experience. By the way, you guys should watch Inception this weekend. It's probably on TBS for free. Is that true? I don't know. Ellen Page is in that as well, right? And Michael Caine. And, uh, Marion Cotillard. Is she in it? I think she's in it. We'll say she is. If she wasn't, she should have been. That's who I would have cast. Remember that time I said, hey, when we're reading something, when we're looking at something, we put it on our phobia, right? So how many of you uh, have a phone and you always try to like hold your phone out here and look at your text messages? Nobody does that, right? You hold it right here because I see you all the time. Because everyone looks like they have a big black square right here on their face but then you realize it's just their phones. So, you want to put something on your phobia, right? When you're reading something, you put it right there so you can see the detail, right? You don't put it out here in the periphery. The reason for that is you've got all your cones jammed up in there, and the way these cones are wired up to the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells is pretty awesome. So, you've got one photoreceptor, one bipolar cell, one ganglion cell. That's a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one relationship, right? So, whatever is coming out of that axon we know, without a doubt, it's from that one photoreceptor. That's pretty cool, right? When you get out into the periphery, and again, these shouldn't be cones, they should all be rods, you might have five or six photoreceptors down to three or four bipolar cells into a ganglion cell. 
when you look at the action potential in that ganglion cell, which photoreceptor was it? I don't know. It was any of these, right? So there's some ambiguity there. It's not the same acuity. It's not the same kind of detailed information. So that's why we put things on our fovea when we want to see them in detail, and we don't put them out in the periphery. Works really well for us, too, that what's in the fovea is uh, sensitive to high levels of light. It gives us color vision, and we're diurnal animals, so we're typically awake during the day. If we were nocturnal animals, maybe this setup wouldn't work as well, right? We'd have to think about something else. Your optic nerve, once you come out of those ganglion cells, you're still in your retina, all of those axons bundle together, they create the optic nerve. This goes back a little bit, it crosses over, right? Sends information to your thalamus, a specific part of your thalamus called the dorsal lateral geniculate nucleus. Typically, we call that the DLGN. Some people just call it the LGN, doesn't matter. This crosses over uh, before you get to the LGN and the optic chiasm. Anybody in a uh, fraternity, sorority, or just a group of nerds who love the Greek alphabet? Uh, chi is the Greek letter for X, right? And so we're having that crossover, not a big deal. I think I'm going to skip blindsight for today. We may not talk about blindsight. We might. You should read about it at least. So, we have a thing called the partial decussation. You remember that left hemisphere to right side of the body, right hemisphere to left side of the body sort of crossover? That's a pretty complete crossover. This is not. That's why it's partial decussation. It's a partial crossover. It's not left eye to right hemisphere, right eye to left hemisphere, right? It's right visual field to left hemisphere. Now, some of you can close one eye and leave the other eye open, right? You can try that. It's a complicated task, yeah. When you do that, you can still see some things over midline, right? Across the middle of your face. There's still some things over here you can see. That information is already sort of where it belongs, right? So there's no point crossing over that information if we're trying to get left visual field to the right hemisphere and right visual field to the left hemisphere. So if you look at this information that goes here, doesn't cross over, that information does. Here's the information that's going to cross over, but that information doesn't. And that way we get all of the left hemisphere, all of the left visual field into the right hemisphere and all of the right visual field over into the left hemisphere. It's kind of fun, right? Let's see, we talked about photoreceptors, we talked about bipolar mental ganglion cells, we talked about that optic nerve and the LGN. Once we get out of the thalamus, we go to the primary visual cortex, V1, also called the striate cortex. Why? Because it's striped. Right? It looks striped when you take a look at it. From V1, we go on to other areas. We got very creative and named them V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, V7, V8. Right? They gave them other names too, but uh, you can label them with these numbers as well. We'll talk about, talk about some interesting visual areas in a moment. Here's another sort of partial decussation. Don't worry about that. When we think about the lateral geniculate nucleus, it actually has six layers uh, plus some other layers. So originally we thought it had six, and then folks were like, well, there are other layers in there too. We're not going to change the name. It's actually sort of shaped like this. How many of you know uh, genu means knee? See how, it's, see how it's bent like a knee? Yeah. So you're going to, that's why it's called the geniculate nucleus, because it's bent. Some people also say that it looks like Napoleon's hat. I'm going to draw Napoleon down here. Anybody a history major? Doesn't have to be accurate then. There you go. Uh, that's the genicular nucleus. Some of the layers are coming from the opposite eye. Some of the layers are coming from the same eye. That's because of that brilliant partial decussation. You guys remember that? 
if we think about the magnocellular layers, that means large. These receptive fields are larger. Okay, we need slightly larger receptive fields sometimes. Helps us detect things that are moving, right? Big kind of things moving around, not giving us a lot of detail. We have parvocellular, that means small. These guys have small receptive fields. They'll give us detailed information about what's out there in the world. Coniocellular, that actually means dust. People didn't think it was very important. In fact, it's probably carrying color information. All right, there's your LGN. Nice and, and knee-shaped there, right? Kind of look at that. You can draw the rest of the leg here and then going down to the foot. For those of you that didn't recognize it looked like a knee. That looks like a knee pad, right? Anybody into roller derby? It's like a roller derby knee pad. No, Taylor, not at all. It's big here, right? Aren't there a couple like roller derby teams? Is it squads? Squads is what you call them. You guys don't know anything. You guys ever go to the roller derby matches? They have them here periodically. It's all flat track, so because there's like different kinds. There's like flat track and angled track, right? Bobby knows. You, you know, so sometimes I get bored and I have the internet so I can learn things. You guys should think about that sometime. Hey, these two guys are awesome. David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel. These guys won a Nobel Prize. They got the Nobel Prize back in the 80s. They did most of their work... Uh, 60s and 70s is kind of when they did their work that got them the Nobel Prize. They actually figured out how your cortex, your visual cortex, responds. Now, all along I've been telling you about sort of these small receptive fields, right? Okay, so if you think about these receptive fields, so these these small circles. It doesn't do you a lot of good if you perceive the entire world as a series of small circles, right? What we need to do is we need to take a bunch of those small circles and we need to integrate those. And if we can integrate those into like a line, that's pretty awesome. If we can integrate it into like two or three lines, guess what we can do then, Rodney? We can actually walk out the door, right? Can you imagine if you perceived that door as just independent circles? How would you ever know how to get out? You wouldn't, right? So your visual system has to take all of those little independent circles and bring those together into coherent shapes, right? And part of that starts in your visual cortex, primary visual cortex. Okay. Don't worry about your cytochrome oxidase blobs. Don't worry about this. This is just showing you that it's a, uh, a layered structure. This is layer four. Notice layer four now has four layers in and of itself. We just didn't add three layers. See, now it has nine layers. Don't worry about thick and thin stripes. They're exciting, but I'm not going to ask you about them. Who wants to watch a movie? Should we watch a movie now? Let's see. Hmm. Let's go two more slides, and then let's watch a movie. And it's, it's like a four-hour movie, so I think we'll have time to finish it before class is over. It's an 11-minute movie that you're going to watch about seven minutes of it. Because we'll, we'll skip through a little bit. But it's going to be exciting. I'm trying to build it up. And you're all going to be disappointed. You've seen it, Taylor. I figured it was the same one. It's the same one, but it's so great. It was awful the first time. Yeah, it's going to be better the second time. It is the It, it, it did change my life, because I... I was, uh, no offense to you, Jaron, I don't, because I don't know your academic sort of investment. I was a, uh, like a back row slacker, uh, right? And so I don't know, you, you used to sit in the front and you just moved back there. Like, I didn't even bother to ever sit in the front. I would just find the seat all the way in the back so I could do whatever I wanted back there, you know. This was before it was sort of, uh, like people weren't bringing laptops and, and mobile phones to class as much, right? Because this was, this was a few years ago when I was in your seat. Uh, before that sort of caught on. And I would just sit back there, and mostly I would just scribble pictures into the margins while I was supposed to be taking notes, right? And then all of a sudden, and then people would yell things at me sometimes, and I would just make up an answer. I guess it was good enough that they didn't kick me out of class. 
So there you go, Jacob. That's what happens. So if you stay in the back row long enough, they'll eventually put you in front of the class. So that's the trajectory. Uh, I was sitting back there, just minding my own business when I should have been paying attention. And all of a sudden, this video comes on the screen. And I thought, man, that's awesome. Uh, I can actually hear action potentials. I think that seems like something I'm interested in. Uh, and at that point, I was like, let's give it a try. And then here I am now, telling you about it. Because I think it's important. Nobody else. Just you, Jaren. So everybody else can just leave. You'll stay and watch the video. I think the rest of you should watch it, too. Probably because I'm going to ask you questions about it on the exam. It's going to be important. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about extra strike cortex. What's that mean? It doesn't mean it's extra stripey, right? It just means it's beyond primary visual cortex. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that information from cortex, from primary visual cortex, combine it together to make all kinds of cool things. We're not going to talk dorsal ventral stream right now. So don't worry about it. There's like these Watt and Ware pathways. I do want to talk to you about on and off ganglion cells. And the reason I want to do this is because this conversation... Uh, will help you understand the video that you're going to watch. Okay? You remember the ganglion cells. Where are those located? I'm going to write it there for you. They're in the retina, right? Yeah, they're out there in the retina. Okay? They have receptive fields. That makes sense. Some of these receptive fields get excited if you put light in the center. And some of them get excited if you put light in the periphery. How do you test that? Put a spot of light in the middle, look at all those action potentials, and then they stop. If you put it in the periphery, look at the absence of action potentials while it's out there. That's called an on cell. You've got your off cells. Put the light in the middle, no action potentials. Put the light outside anywhere. It doesn't have to be there. You get a bunch of action potentials. That's how these guys get excited, right? Those are in the retina. We're going to send those on to the LGN. Once we get to the... To the uh, LG and we send this up to cortex. What we've done, I like to think about these as donuts, right? They kind of look like donuts. They got a center, they've got a surround. That's pretty awesome, right? But do you know what's better than a donut? A box of donuts, right? So what you can do is you can take, and this happens, you will take these receptive fields. <laughs> you can stack them like this okay so now what you've done is you've lined up sort of all of these excitatory center regions right and all of these sort of inhibitory surrounding regions and what you've done is you've created a receptive field shaped like this That's pretty cool, right? That'll tell you where there's an edge. Do you know why edges are awesome? So you don't fall off the edge of a cliff. So you don't fall down the stairs. So you don't walk into a door frame, right? You need to know where edges are. And so these guys are great edge detectors. Now later we can take a bunch of these edge detectors and put them together. You know, if you were to put an edge detector like that and then put one this way. one this way and guess what now we've detected a door it's pretty awesome right so there you go don't worry about that okay now let's stop and watch a video hey who are those people who loved cat videos yeah, so this is a cat video. You're not going to see the cat. Always tell. Oh, I, hey, I got the new Google Chrome. I didn't know that. I was excited about that. All right. It's purple because I've clicked on it before. I always wonder about the videos they attach to this. Right, like, like these are supposed to be related, right? Like this one makes sense, but then I get Robin Williams on on, the, on Carson with Jonathan Winters. 
That means nothing to, to most of you. There are like two of you who I think that reference makes some sense. So what we're going to see is you're going to see a projector screen. And I don't just mean like that projector screen. I mean you're going to see a video of a projector screen. Okay? And on this projector screen, they're going to shine a beam of light, like a little square of light. In the background, you're going to hear some pops and some crackles, right? That's going to be the action potentials. So what they've done is they they have a cat. They have an electrode in the cat's visual cortex. Again, you're not going to see the cat, okay? They are going to record the electrical activity of that cell as they try to activate its receptive field with that, uh, that bar of light, okay? So they're going to have that action potential. It's going to go out. It's going to go to this audio monitor, and you're going to hear this noise, right? You're going to hear those action potentials. They're going to use this bar of light. They're using an ophthalmoscope, actually. So the same thing they shine in your eye at the eye doctor. They're going to shine that onto the screen, right? And as they move it around, you'll see they'll move. They'll kind of mark the location, so they'll map out the receptive field. Then they're going to, to, they're going to take that bar of light, and they're going to move it through that receptive field and determine the properties of the cell, okay? This is going to be a simple cell. That's the first one they're going to do. It's going to have an inhibitory two inhibitory flanks and an excitatory uh, center. Next, they're going to do a complex cell. That complex cell is not going to have an inhibitory region. Okay, The whole thing's going to be excitatory, but it's going to be orientation selective. So we'll see when they orient the bar of light in different degrees, it's not going to get as excited unless it matches. Finally, we're going to watch one that's direction selective. Now, that's really exciting. So they will move the bar of light in one direction, the cell will get more active when they move it in the other direction. It's not going to be as active. Okay? Are the noise coming from the cat's eyes? No, it's coming from their cortex, their visual cortex in the back of their head. Yeah, and it's not really, I mean, it's just electrical signals that they're measuring. They're converting it into uh, a sound through an audio monitor. Are you ready? It's going to be thrilling.
So this cell is a This one's direct. Exciting that was. Um, the cat was anesthetized. Probably had some contact lenses. Anyway, those guys won a Nobel Prize. That's all you have to do to win a Nobel Prize. Just do that. Uh, I wouldn't recommend trying that now since they already did it. So you need a new idea. But you know that should be pretty easy, right? They just give those Nobel prizes out to anybody. That's not true. All right, let's talk about color perception. How many of you have ever seen colors? Uh, is there anyone who is colorblind and would like to share that information? Yeah, that's fine. So either you're not colorblind or you don't want to share it. I don't know which. It didn't really, it didn't really help. Uh, we do have what's called trichromatic coding. So there are three cone types. Uh, most people will think about these as uh, red, blue, and green. Right? Uh, you'll typically think about them as the color types. That's not exactly the best way to think about them because, again, color is a perception. Uh, we have to think about how, what are they sensitive to, like the wavelengths, right? So referring to the wavelength is, uh, is a much better way to do it. But we'll get there when we do. Uh, if we talk about someone who's missing one, two, or three cone types, or they've got a problem with their cone types, then we can use different words. Uh, Protonopia is the most common type of color blindness is still not terribly common. I think maybe two to three percent of men are color blind. It's still a fairly small number. Females, it's it, uh, 
very unlikely that a female would be colorblind. The reason for that is it's a sex lien um, issue. So it's on the X chromosome. Females get two of those. So if one of those is sort of, you know, screwed up, you can just use the other one. Males, on the on other hand, you only get one X. If that one's screwed up, you got to use it, right? Because there's important stuff on the uh, X chromosome. Not so much on the Y. There's important stuff on the X. There are three different types of photoreceptors. They do have different absorption, what we call absorption spectra. We'll talk about that. That's based on the particular type of uh, opsin, the particular type of photopigment, that molecule that's in there. They're all three going to have slightly different molecules, and so they're going to be sensitive to slightly different wavelengths of light. So this is sort of interesting, uh, nice graph here to show you. We have our what we think of as our blue cone, but really you should think about that as a short wavelength sensitive. Your green is a medium, and the red is long, right? Now most people who are colorblind are going to be red-green colorblind, and you can sort of see why that's going to be the most common from this uh, diagram, right? Look how close the peaks are for your medium and long, your red and green photoreceptors. So if there's any sort of problem with either of these, it doesn't have to be completely missing. They could just be um, shifted a little bit, right? They could have, you can have a genetic issue where there's a problem with your, your green photoreceptors and we're just gonna shift this over. So let's put the peak here. Now look how much overlap there is between the red and the green, right? You're not going to be able to tell the difference when those wavelengths of light come in. It's all going to look the same. Both of those cone types are going to be equally excited. And you're going to think, well, I'm definitely seeing red or green. You don't know which. So here's a great test for colorblindness. These are the numbers that you should see. If you don't see those numbers, you should probably uh, go see your eye doctor and get that checked. Right? Those are the correct numbers. Um, they're not the correct numbers. Most of you can definitely see, I think everyone should see that's the number one, and then the number five. Some of you might have difficulty with the number 29. Again, that's because protonopia is the most common. Uh, there are about you know, a few of you who might have difficulty with that, but I doubt anybody. I'm probably not gonna ask you too much about opponent process coding, um, but the way these receptive fields are structured, your red and greens are going to be opposite, and then your blues and yellows. So don't don't worry too much about that. We should talk about negative after images, though. These are kind of fun, right? So if you will stare at that uh, white plus sign for about 30 minutes, and then we'll, uh, not 30 minutes, we don't have to wait that long. Uh, if you stare at it for just a few seconds, and then look over into the blank section, you know, over at the, uh, the black plus sign, you'll probably see an after image. If you didn't, just stare a little, go back and stare a little bit longer at the apple. You gotta fixate on it, don't move your eyes around, uh, as, as tempting as that will be. You will probably see a red apple and a green uh, leaf and stem, right? That's what you should see. If you think about this, this um, is kind of interesting. Why, why do you see these after images? So if you continue to stare here, right, that's green. All of those sort of medium Cones, the ones that are sensitive to green light, what we would see as green light, they're going to become fatigued, right? Very fatigued. So they're going to kind of stop responding. When you go over here and look, and you look at this uh, this area, you're not getting anything that's going to stimulate, you know, one with the, with the white uh, background. It's not going to stimulate one cone type more than the other, right? So all you're going to see are what what is the opposite color there, you know, with that opponent color processing which set of receptors are still going to be active. It's going to be the red ones. Those guys that were green, they're going to be below baseline activity. These red guys are just going to be there kind of at, you know, standard average activity, but that difference is going to appear bigger, right? This is why I, I explained to my other class, you shouldn't grade on a curve, right? If I were to grade on a curve in this class, most of you could just really do horrible, and then one of you gets like, uh, you know, half the questions right. Well, comparing it to the rest of your class, who was maybe getting 30% of their questions right, you look like you did really well. But in fact, you only knew half of what you should have, right? And that's what's happening here. 
these red guys aren't doing anything extra. They're just there. But the green guys have all left, right? They're all fatigued and they're out of it. So the red guys look so much better. They're so much more active by comparison that you perceive red in that area instead of, uh, you know, just white. Because it's all about this relative cone excitation ratio, which you don't really have to think about. But it's still exciting. Here's some stuff about these different systems. I'm not going to ask you too much. What and where, and coneal cellular pathways, I'm not going to ask you much about that. Let's talk about those extra striate areas and what they are doing with visual information. Because every step that we go up, David, we're going to do something a little more complicated, right? So what about uh, color sensitive regions? We call that particular area V8. Some folks did an fMRI study to figure this out. They put people in an fMRI. They show you images that are uh, contain color or ones that are grayscale. Then they figure out which brain regions are only active when you see the color images. That happened to be area V8. Not a big deal. The way to confirm that is to go around and cut out area V8 from people and then see if they can still see color. There aren't a whole lot of people letting us do that. So what you have to do instead is wait until someone has brain damage to area V8 and give them color test. And these folks did this 10 or 12 years ago. They actually found 92 people, which is you know, a fair number for this. Uh, those folks all had confirmed damage to area V8, and they all had a chromatopsia. So they could not see color. Now you had to verify that this was not a retinal issue, right, because they could have been... Um, you know, achromatic in that sense be if they had a problem with their retina, but they confirmed that was not the case. Don't worry about this because we need to move along just a little bit. <laughs> Area V2 is going to handle spatial information. I'm not going to ask you about this, but we're starting to, to figure out form. How many of you love Abraham Lincoln? It's always an interesting thing, right? Uh, Jaron, for you, those images might look pretty similar, right, from that distance. Uh, the farther you are away, the more similar these images will, will appear. If you get close to them, they'll actually appear quite different. Uh, and that's because some of them contain, they all contain this low frequency information. But the high frequency information has been taken away from the picture here on the right. So that one's missing some, some extraneous high information, high, high frequency information that we've put on top of that that creates that pixelated image, right? But if you get far enough away, that high frequency, um, that high frequency information will sort of blend in. And you're not going to be able to pull that out because your receptive fields are not large enough to tell the difference. So there you go. Reminds me of those, I don't know, uh, when I was an undergrad, a guy had a picture of, um, well, it was Einstein, let me take that back. It was Marilyn Monroe w when you looked at it from a distance, and then as you got closer, it turned into Einstein, I think is how that worked, which was sort of an interesting, uh, an interesting thing. Yeah. They also think, how many, and we're just going to do another art lesson, how many of you have ever heard of the Mona Lisa? Yeah, that's a fairly famous painting, right? I mean, I think some people have heard of this. Uh, so if you think about her smile, she had that sort of... This is why I'm not an artist. There's Mona Lisa's smile for you. Uh, <laughs> it's definitely ambiguous. Uh, so if you if you look at her, her mouth and the way that it's, it's painted, the, uh, the spatial frequency on that creates the ambiguity and that's why it's kind of hard to tell, like, is she really smiling or not smiling? Or maybe she looks like she's smiling some days, but not others, right? Depends on how you look at it. So, so there you go. That's, uh, that's your art history lesson for today. Hey, what about uh, pattern recognition? That's important. Why is pattern recognition important? Without pattern recognition, you're not going to be, like, reading. Right? So that's kind of important. Recognizing objects, things like that. We use all kinds of visual patterns to know where things are and what's going on. There are a couple brain regions here, TEO and TE. If you remove those, uh, animals are no longer able to determine um, patterns, which is kind of cool. Don't worry so much about this one. 
but here are some interesting stories we should talk about. Uh, anytime we talk about an agnosia, that's when someone can't see something. So there are different kinds of agnosias where people can't see faces or, uh, you know, like objects, things like that. They don't, those objects don't make sense to them. That's kind of interesting. I should tell you about this area called the fusiform face area. <clears throat> How many of you are experts at recognizing faces? All of you are. Uh, trust me, David. Even though you think you're not, you are. Uh, although, if you're trying to use this as an excuse to get you out of some trouble that you're in, feel free to, to continue down that path. I'm going to tell you it's not successful, right? I'm not going to tell you I tried it. I'm just going to say I know it's not successful. That's, that's not a way to get yourself out of trouble. Like, you know, my fusiform face area doesn't work very well. I wasn't sure who it was, but they seemed friendly. Um, and I can't believe it wasn't you. It's not really, it doesn't work. So fusiform face here is going to help you recognize faces. <clears throat> As a social species, uh, which means we are a species that live in close contact with other members of our species, it's very important to recognize who another person is, what you've done to them, and what they've done to you, right? That's very important for social interactions, okay? There are other species that also have, uh, that live in social environments. Interestingly, paper wasps, the paper wasp, is a uh, it's an insect it also has facial recognition uh, which is kind of interesting so they, they did this whole series of studies to demonstrate this I won't go into the details but these insects because uh, they live in social co colonies and it's important to know who each member of the colony is so they have to recognize them somehow they do it through faces uh, same way that we do right so we've got that fusiform face area it's also activated anytime you're using something that has like fine discriminations, right? So if I were to ask you, just, you know, randomly pick out two people, you're going to be able to tell that they're two different people, right? Unless I've accidentally randomly selected identical twins. Let's assume I didn't do that. Let's assume that identical twins only count as one person because that's really only one face, right? Even though it's two different people. So if you randomly select two different faces, we're all going to be able to determine that those are two different faces. In fact, I think what you don't realize is how similar all of your faces are, right? All of your faces are very, very similar. You know why, Rodney? You've all got noses. You've all got mouths and eyes and eyebrows and ears, right? Those are the kind, you put a chin on there, it's a face. Those are the common elements of a face. If I compare a face and a rock, those are really different. But a face and a face, they're similar. And so if we weren't experts at determining differences in faces, small differences sometimes, right? If you really think about it, the shape of a chin, position of the eyes and the nose, these are very, very small differences, right? And so we're really great at determining those differences. Um, that doesn't mean we make, don't make mistakes sometimes, because we clearly do. But if you were to take um, a species who doesn't have facial recognition and show them two faces of a human, they might not be able to pull that apart, right? They might not be able to tell the difference. So they might be using something else. So that fusiform face area is important. We also use it, um, anybody here who's into birding? You might know that as bird watching, um, but unless you, you know, if you are a birder, then you know it's called birding. Uh, that's the technical term. So if you're into bird watching, right, there are small differences in different species of birds. Uh, you know, you might think, well, there's a blue jay and a cardinal, but there are all kinds of birds that look similar to both of those, and you have to know the fine differences. And if you're not into that, then, then you're not going to, you know, know what's going on, but your, your brain could get excited about it, um, if you were. You want to hear a story about chimpanzee butts? Sure, Because I've got one, and it's a winner. So, a few years ago, they did this study with uh, chimpanzees that was eye tracking, and they kind of wanted to see, okay, what is this, what is this chimpanzee doing if it's watching another chimpanzee, right? So, they would put these male chimpanzees in front of this video screen and they would track their eye movements. And they do this with humans all the time, it's not a big deal. They showed it a video of a female chimpanzee walking across the screen, right? And so the whole time the chimpanzee's eyes are going like face butt, face butt, face butt, face butt, face butt, all across the screen, that's all it's doing. Face butt, face butt, face butt, face butt. And so that's kind of weird, right? Like why is it going face butt, face butt, face butt all the time? What's interesting about chimpanzees though, um, and particularly their butts, they have wrinkles. Right? I don't know if you guys have ever seen a chimpanzee butt up close. Uh, but chimpanzee butts are wrinkly. 
This is interesting, Taylor. And they're wrinkled apparently in different ways. So chimpanzees can can recognize other people by their or other chimpanzees by their butt wrinkles, right? So if you've got like a chimpanzee butt, this is a chimpanzee butt here, by the way. So there's like one, and then I don't know. There's another chimpanzee butt, and then. There's a third chimpanzee butt, and they have different wrinkle patterns. And so they can actually recognize other members of their species with butt wrinkles. See, that's exciting. That woke some of you up. Some of you were asleep all day with your eyes open, and you're like, chimpanzee butts, that gets me excited. Um, there you go. I just, I start to wonder, so this is my thinking, right, Jacob, on this, like, how far away do they have to be to recognize that other chimpanzee by its butt, right? Because I'm thinking about, like, a chimpanzee's butt and the butt wrinkles, and I'm thinking, like, I think I have to be pretty close to see those wrinkles. And if I really have to start identifying people by their butt wrinkles, I want to be able to do that from a distance, right? I really want to have, like, super visual acuity, so, like, from 100 feet away, I can tell who that, that person is. But, I don't know, maybe chimpanzees are different. That was an interesting story, right? I mean, you're not going to get that in any other class. I promise you. Nobody's going to talk to you about chimpanzee butts. Wait till we talk about gorilla testicles. That's going to be a fun one. Hey, you've also got this thing called the extra striate body area. Guess what? He gets excited by random body limbs, body parts. Just an arm floating around, a leg, a headless body. Those are fun, right? So here's kind of a nice graph. This is your fusiform face area. Here's your extra stripe body area. You show faces or headless bodies. Fusiform face area is going to get excited about that, not just random objects or body parts. On the other hand, your extra stripe body area gets excited about headless bodies and body parts, but not so much faces or assorted objects, right? So you have different brain regions that are specifically looking for specifically <laughs> responding to in this case uh, human bodies right which is good because we see a lot of human bodies right I mean most of them hopefully have heads right depends on your job and don't worry about perihippocampal play theory we'll talk about that sometime hey what about kids kids look at faces right that happens uh, how many of you were ever an eight-year-old child most of you, I think, were that at one point, right? Think about how many faces you had seen when you were eight compared to, you know, like 10 years later even. I think most of you have been 18-year-old adults, right? Or 18-year-old children, either way you want to say that. Um, most of you have been 18-year-old humans, right? I think we're all above that. So, by the time you get to be an adult, look how much bigger your fusiform face area is, right? And the reason for that is over time you see more people you interact with more people right you become much better at organizing and recognizing the features of people's faces and those small differences right so that you can determine who someone is so there's some developmental time course there now this has been in case you want to know this has actually been scaled up to sort of match the size of the adult brain right so we can account for that because eight-year-old brains are slightly smaller than adult brains So you have two eyes, creates this thing called retinal disparity. This is a disparity that you want, right? There are some disparities that you don't, but this one is one that we do want. Retinal disparity is an okay disparity. Might be the only disparity that's okay, but we'll go with it. It gives you binocular vision, but well, sometimes we call it stereoscopic or uh, stereopsis. You have two different views of the world from slightly different angles. You can use those two views to predict and project where things are out in space, right? That gives you depth perception. Now, there are many things that you can use to determine how far something is, you know, relative to something else. Perspective is one. Relative retinal size is one. If something takes up more space on your retina, it's probably closer to you. That's fairly true if the two things are the same size, right? If an elephant takes up more space on your retina than a mouse, it may not actually be closer. Elephants are just bigger. But you do know if the mouse takes up more space on your retina 
then it's probably clawing out your eyes. Uh, because it's that close, right? It takes up more space than an elephant. So that's exciting. Who loves mice in the face? Uh, Hubel and Diesel, we talked about that. Orientation sensitivity. Hey, remember that awesome video that you just watched? Didn't they just do this? Right? So I don't have to talk about it because you saw it. Optic flow. How many of you have ever moved through space and time? Happens to you all the time, right? Uh, so, Sammy, you're, you're cruising down the road. I don't know. You're running down the sidewalk. Uh, you know, maybe you're trying to get a hot dog. I don't know what you do with your life. It's up to you. Uh, things fly past you, right? They're moving past you. That's optic flow. There are some people who have the inability to perceive movement. That's going to be bad. Because either you're moving or other things are moving all the time, right? And if all you're getting are these like static, periodic images, you're not going to have any idea what's going on in the world, and that's going to be very difficult. These people are, like, if you're sitting in a room, this is true, and they will, uh, they can see everything, but you could be up just like dancing around and they wouldn't see you, but they could see all the chairs and the tables and everything else. Like, so they could perceive the rest of everything, but they couldn't perceive uh, the parts that are moving, which is bad because if you think about like crossing the street, for example, like the road doesn't move, the buildings don't move, the sidewalk stays pretty well static, uh, but Rodney, those cars keep moving, right? And if you couldn't see those cars moving and you're just like, hey, the road looks pretty clear to me, I don't know what that noise is. It's not going to be good for you. Mm -hmm. Motion viewing happens. Uh, so there's an area out here called MT. That's not empty. It's MT. Uh, and that's actually sensitive to uh, visual motion. Mm -hmm. I don't have to think about that too much. Here's a whole chart of all of the areas in your brain that uh, are handling visual information. It's like three whole pages, so there's a lot. A lot of your brain is devoted to visual processing. We are a highly visual species, right? If you were to look at a bat's cortex, probably not as much. If you look at a rat, not as much devoted to uh, vision, more is devoted to olfactory sensation or somatosensory, right? Because that's how they get around their environment. So it's a different process. All right. Does anybody have any